we are even looking at families which are intergenerational. Um, I think they are, they are your audience, right? So when you say what is the value of working with them, I think if you are working for, from the perspective of arts, any leaders, they are the audience uh, in many ways and they are equal to any other audience. But what I find interesting is we can't work with them the same way, right? So a lot of my sort of understanding of this panel is how do we sort of learn from each other and how do we better engage these audiences? It's not simply a question of being open to their sort of saying, yes, we welcome from the audiences, right? But how do we actually do that? And so um, I'm going to just say that for me, the value is, I don't know if I'm copying out of this question, but I think it is a little bit, um, <laughs> It's, it's I, I don't know. As an art educator, I think they are my biggest audience in many ways. So I really believe that more effective change can be brought uh, when you engage with younger, um, at, at a younger age. Um, you know, so they're developing so many skills, and then a lot of the experience in that age it carries on to how they perceive things, how they experience things later on as well. Developing their critical thinking, their social emotional skills. If you are able to bring these things to them and introduce them to, introduce them to these different aspects, I think that's I think you have to put your part in the educator and I love the educator as well. That's where they call That's what I see by the way. The fact that a student can remember us in five or ten years down the line for something that we have made felt that you feel is Uh, the value is that uh, this is developing children's ability, uh, creatively, ethically, competently, and responsible to reach their full uh, potential to the fullest become the foundation for uh, life. Yeah, and then uh, the art experience as a process that is and will be embedded in life as an asset in the future. So they see experiences of the value. Thank you. So, uh, so I think we are generally agreed on that socializing younger people into thinking about art as part of a lot of the larger experience of becoming an adult, fully realized adult, as you said. Uh, this is in it's, uh, it's important because they need to participate in it in order to be able to do you know, At the end of the day, what is it that art does? What is it that art does? And you know, many people you know, around us are today, you know, uh, sort of there are many assumptions of what art allows you to do, what we are to place art in, in, in the world around us. And one of the things that is about imagination, it's about, about possibilities, about you know, uh, where things go to it. And the earlier you see, possibility of those imaginings. I think that's kind of what uh, what media and actually uh, allows us to do. So let me, let me start with, because you know, I'm sure you raised a question of how, right? And, and uh, we all approach the question of, we all, we all approach the question of different ways, right? Like, so some of us approach the what, some of us approach the why, some of us approach the how, and I think let's find out, you know, where each of us in a way begins from. So would you like to start out by telling us what are the some of, what are some of the interesting formats that we've explored and what and what what uh, what have you learned from them and uh, why do you do them the way you do? Um, well, I think it's all about you know, the process of creating the experience. Right? So um, so Jandi, honestly my answer is not going to be revolutionary. I was thinking of this question of yours. And um, I'm also going to pick up on some of the things that we've already heard about from the other panelists. And I just want to say that, you know, it can be as simple as getting children, especially if you work uh, with large groups of children, let's say a school group, right? Getting them into an art space and not beginning with uh, don't touch the art, right? Or rules that begin in the negative. And when we talk about exposing them to the, to the arts, I think to make it something that is that becomes a regular part of their lives, that allows them to achieve all these potentials that art can help them achieve. I think it's important to have them just experience that space 
as um, just a space of joy, right? So when you say format, it's simple things as maybe not saying keep quiet in an art space. You know, maybe allowing them to sit down in an art space, ask questions, don't even tell them anything, but let them lead the conversation. So it could be as simple as what are the questions they want answered. Maybe they answer it themselves, maybe they just look closer at the art. So when I look at, uh, of course, all of this changes based on not just age group, but also the amount of exposure these kids have already had. You can't say all six graders are the same. So we're definitely uh, looking at A, understanding that your format has to change based on every single session that you do. It can't be a format that you, you know, try to replicate. But it, it could be as simple as just being like, okay, let's sit down, we open this gallery, let's look around, let's actually move through this space on your own without having too many don't lose, don't touch, don't uh, be quiet. So I think that's after that, just making it a space of the digital that allows them to... Also, you know, uh, again, I come back, I work a lot with schools. So I think when we come in with school, the teacher has already made certain food with this, this is it. And you are there as an art mediator, we need to break those boundaries, to allow them that freedom that maybe a school or a teacher can't do. And the other thing is maybe what perception is, it's not so, in my mind at least, it's not so outcome focused, it's more process over product. Because everything is focused so learning outcome focused. And yes, when you're talking to the teacher, it's a different conversation, right? You're couching it because they have to bring their students in. But with the students themselves, it can be a little bit more open in. So, so one of the formats that we work with right now with it is thematic curriculum. So using the art as a medium to make concepts to students. For example, we recently had a workshop on masculine. So how do you talk about a concept and masculine that is a little more that is a little heavy to younger yes. audiences? I'm I mean talk you just put a footnote. That's exactly what I'm gonna talk about the Joe Morales thing saying that you know. It's framing that they're resisting it. And what you're, what you're doing when you put in a particular uh, when you put in a particular frame like that is you're doing exactly for that frame. So yes, please go on and tell us. So basically using art as a medium. So when you talk in a uh, when you take into a classroom, there's students uh, having discussions, doing scrubbing activities, doing photography, and then just learning about what they perceive that concept as and what they perceive.
conversation, dialogue between them, and it's a way equal learning together. It's not only one effect, yeah, but it's like something that can be noted through uh, the IEP in the fund, for example. In the, uh, and then also with uh, so many um, materials and methods, actually. If I were to ask you, what is it that they are doing? Like, no matter what format, what is it that you think they are doing? Maybe the outcomes aren't, you know, the most uh, interesting way. Also because most of us were in relatively informal spaces. So, what is it in your opinion? I mean, you might sort of go out on a little bit, something like, uh, uh, what's up? What are you doing? What do you think they are doing? So you're in a classroom to teach them, for example, completion of photography, they are developing that skill, yes. But at the same time, when they're in that space, they're picking up so, so many more skills, like their social skills, they post, they're working in teams, they're able to, you know, pair up with kids that they probably wouldn't talk uh, to in like classrooms. So that space of just conversation happens, they can make use of how the other person is feeling, uncomfortable. Am I audible? Is this 
it's okay? Yeah? yeah? Okay, fine. Change your mind as well. Change mind as well? Okay. Um, Okay, so, um, yeah, yes, so the, the, the thing is, you know, uh, in galleries and museums, uh, so there are, there are two kinds of activities you see here, right? And one is where you get young people to engage in art that is being made by artists, and another is to get them to produce or work with art themselves, right? So at least two aspects to this work. So I'll ask uh, the uh, first question is, given, you know, given the way things are changing, given the ephemerality of much around us, uh, why do we want the young to engage with historical or existing knowledge and create experience of any kind? So basically, why do we want them to engage with our work of okay. Be it historical or be it otherwise. Um, so I, I mean, you know, because you mentioned legacy, right? Like, like that you, you introduce them to it and you help them sort of build their relationship to it and take it forward. And you work in galleries and museums. So could you help us understand how you look at it, right? Like why, why do you think we need to, you know, why, should, why should the young care about what's on it? Instead of saying maybe in that Right, so I don't usually, I'm not an art educator in the sense of being made art. So I come at it from a museum education perspective, and it's very informal, it's outside of curriculum, notion. And I think, I mean, exposure to anything visual, anything that's more of anything that we all believe has value, can only expand the whole view. How do they look to today or to tomorrow? How do they uh, there are also, you know, it's it's different things, right? What does what do we mean by account space? It could be a city street which has historical architecture, which helps us understand how their own living spaces have evolved and changed and built. It can be uh, visual arts, it can be theater, it can be photography, it can be many other things. So I just think that by seeing it all and engaging in conversations around it by asking questions and even just simply by understanding that there's no wrong way to read a book about right? That there are no wrong answers in certain situations. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, yeah, I think that's important, that it involves what they can think of today and of the future. I think, and I think there's of adults as well, you know, adults don't engage historically or engage visually at all. Or I always wonder, like, how do you structure your world if you love knowing what's happening? So to start with, I think what Alicia says makes sense, right? Like exactly to know what happened before, what an understanding of that, so that you move forward and when you create things, you have that in your sense. But at the same time, I think it's to also find a sense of relatability as to they have been people who have felt what I have felt and they have created this world who are out of it. So maybe there is a way for me to work with this emotion, work with what I'm feeling and to actually bring something out of it. I could materialize it. Way. I think that is something that can come with me when young people or even artists work or you know, look back at what has been created already, find a sense of inspiration and say, at the same time relatability if I just go ahead and feeling it, what can they do with it? Come back to relatability. Okay. Um, so this is a very hard question. <laughs> yeah, well, also what I'm thinking uh, that uh, I think it's like the truth that we uh, where we came from. It's like a local that uh, for me, for example, I, I really want my son to know about the Manchester as well. So they and then they can make this story to the other generation. Which is it's very important for you to pass to the other generation. So they uh, knowing about the locally anchored the roots and things like that. So the history was important and then yeah. So it's uh, it's great your also your 
quality of like, your individual or something like that. Yeah. It's brown or uh, yeah. roots or something. Yeah, so uh, relativism, I mean, clearly you've established yourself as a Gen Z or by using the word relativism already. Because uh, most of the word previous generations used uh, most comfortably. And what does, what does that mean? Right? Okay, so is it relatable to me? Or, so in a sense, it, it becomes about me. Um, whereas, there is also the value in a work of art being able to establish the strangeness of the other. And strangeness of the other is somehow has become a very bad term to use, but that this is different from me, and it's actually quite fabulous. So there's that aspect of it. And a work of art, including you know literature or a uh, film or a piece of work, and so on and so like that. And of course, as you can tell, the point about intergenerational conversation is incredibly important uh, for ideas to uh, ideas to travel, for experiences to travel, and for us to make in a way collective mean, right? Because at the end of the day, what do you do when you stand in front of an art, a, a work in front of a work of art, is to try to create meaning. To interpret it and sometimes curators come the way and interpret it for you and sometimes you, you, you have the freedom to get it from the priest and interpret it for yourself as well. Uh, so you know so so all of that all of that work does happen. Um, I'm going to open up for questions but before that I just want to ask one question to uh, our three panelists uh, which is I'd like you to share with us two ideas one that you want who work with young adults of, of any age, uh, the young and young adults. One thing that you want us to think about, and one thing you might actually urge us to do, right? So no matter what we practice, so we might not be engaged with young adults ourselves, you know, and our audience would be this, you know, fairly diverse. So, uh, if you could just each of you share one idea, uh, two ideas each, one, what you want us to think about, one, what you want us to do, and then we'll open up for questions. Daniel, do you want to start? Okay, she's still free. Alicia, go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm going to keep this uh, quite brief, I think. Uh, we'll wrap this up quickly. But I think one thing to think about is as people running art spaces or running exhibition spaces and things like that, I think, you know, I often hear the terminology that, oh, this is a great show, we should get schools in, they should come, college students should come, everyone should come. But the idea is that, you know, is it confident that you want them to see or you know, are we thinking about maybe what they might enjoy seeing, right? Not just at a show that you put on and then latterly you're saying, oh, it's great for kids and everyone should come in. I think we need to think about actually even, like you said, what do they want to see, right? What is it that we can um, create for them? Yeah, because I don't think they're the audience that you're thinking about when you're curating exhibitions, uh, the first thing. And secondly, sorry if I'm stepping on any toes there, but uh, the other thing when, when I say what we should do is actually, it is not just important enough to say we would love young people to come in, you have to plan for them. I said this to you guys in the talks, it is all logistics. You know, they come in large groups because if you tell a school come, they're not going to bring 30 students, they book a bus, they're going to bring 100. Can you manage that? Do you have enough educators? Do you have enough trained educators? Can you open early so that they can come at a time when they get a free run of the space? It's logistics. You can't just say, oh, come, no, you want to reach out to schools. You have to speak the language of teachers. You have to speak to parents and bring them in. So it really is that you need to have people who are trained and dedicated to doing it, not someone who's doing 20 different things and also then responsible for bringing the young people. Uh, so, I mean, a few things that come to my mind is to just develop that bit of a simple attitude, not so simple as well as that, but sort of simple empathy uh, in classrooms, just understand what the student has to say about what we're presenting, then just, it's not a one-way conversation, it has to be something that we always learn, we learn so much in classroom and education as well, is to have that space for them to also share what they're feeling, what they're doing, and just even when they're creating art, what is and at the same time, is to involve, I think this applies more to uh, people who go into classrooms, is to have involved the inner circles of students. For example, of just creating a smaller showcase in a classroom, right? We might have had an engagement with, uh, with the students. So just 
create a small exhibition in just one corner of the classroom, or some auditorium in the school, and just include their teachers, and just their parents and their peers. And the kind of confidence that that, that brings to the students at that point of time is something that will get carried on as they do. It's just the fact that I'm seeing, I, I can create this, I am good, good at this, and just kind of get this idea of how to perceive themselves can make a lot of different things. So kind of just more ways to showcase them and like to uh, showcase their work and kind of make them the center of it. Something that I would urge to do. So, uh, art is uh, part of our daily life, so it's not separate. And then let them experience it together with us. And then put the knowledge education in the beginning from for example, for an exhibition or event, it's not like you finish this and then you're thinking about the program, but it's include uh, everything from the beginning and then appreciate them and then open the dialogue with them. So it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. okay. So we've got some sort of fairly uh, logistical, but also in terms of ideas um, from the chair by the panel. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so uh, there's anybody in the audience who would like to ask any of our panelists, um, please go ahead. Okay, so there's that lady there and then the gentleman there. And then the lady here. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. You've got a tradition with Sarkis being there. Maybe you Going into depth, into no matter what 
topics or training or tools that we learn. So there has to be respect for what disciplines have allowed us to do. I mean, when, you know, uh, when, I, when I get a very particular kind of uh, infection in a very particular place in the left eye and, you know, I want someone to know exactly what's happening. So I want them to know that kind of death of knowledge. But at the same time, I want, I who cares about what I want. But, you know, so, so we, we need that. We need the depth as well, but we also need breadth, and that breadth can come in the foundational years. So I think where you're absolutely right is in pointing out that those have to come very early on. It can't come as an afterthought. In India, often philosophy is something people go after in time. History of philosophy, so, which is highly used to come. Does anyone else sort of have something to say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've got time for one last question now, and then we can close. I take drawing classes for young kids. And I mean, I don't teach them, I learn from them. I draw something which is uh, quite realistic because I cannot stop myself. I am learning to be abstract with them. Because the way they perceive the shapes, it's amazing to see. I mean, uh, I cannot stop myself uh, teaching these young kids. I mean, I'm learning from them. So I promote drawing classes and I try to teach, I mean, I try to tell parents it's not just a hobby class, but it's actually shaping in that early ages. I mean, I'm teaching to the students of uh, six, four years old. The youngest one is four years old. He does amazing work. I mean, I'm trying to uh, tell their pa parents he, he has a lot of caliber. I mean, you just don't, don't focus on other parts of it, but drawing is also one way of expression. That's what I wanted to share. That's nothing else. Thank, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here and for uh, listening in. And thank you very much to my co-panelists for.